peste și cât vrem să ne întoarcem ca să depășim primul punct și dacă nu vreți neapărat concluzia, apoi atunci rămânem măcar cu exercițiu fizic că ne-am mișcat un pic și am dansat uh, cu sau fără camere. Dragilor, mă bucur foarte mult să invităm în scenă alături de noi din nou uh, pentru încheierea acestei conferințe. Todd, welcome back and uh, will be followed by his colleague in a couple of minutes. Please welcome back in a big round of applause, Bucharest Integrity Gathering. <laughs> Thank you. So good afternoon again. We are now uh, very much in the home stretch. I have just a few more things I want to share with you and then Steve will wrap up the day. So thanks for, thanks for persisting and sticking with us today. So remember where we were when we left off a while ago. We were talking through the five actions of a leader. And just to get us back in the spirit of that discussion, Can you tell me what was number one? Remember it was start, started with an L, what was that? Lay out the vision. After you do that, what do you do? Engage others and collaborate. Then what do you do? Throw in some capability, good. So now that we have those three elements, we're going to move on to number four, which is this topic of inspiring and, and energizing. So can you think of some leaders who are well known for their ability to inspire? Nelson Mandela is a great example. Others? Who? Yeah, good, good. Hmm? Okay. Yeah, great, great. Aren't these easy? People who are inspiring really make a mark on us, don't they? We remember them. I have a couple of others to share with you, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I drop it, I forget to turn it on, but otherwise I'm in complete control up here, okay, so don't worry. Okay, John F. Kennedy made this quote, which uh, I'll just let you read. I'm sure you've seen this before, but it's a great example of someone who is asking people to rise above themselves. So he's saying, don't just look out for you, but look out for all of those in your, all of those in your, whoops, <laughs> all of those in your community, all of those in your, in your country, in your society. So there's a good example of inspiring. But another one is Mother Teresa. And I, I think she's an especially important example that I wanted to share with you because all of us, when we think about inspiring, if you're like me, when you think about inspiring, you think about Martin Luther King Jr. speaking to those thousands of people on the Lincoln Memorial. Or you think about other people who stand up in front of big crowds and give fiery speeches and get people really excited. But it's important to know that, first of all, not all of us are going to have the ability to inspire in that way, right? But every one of us has the ability to inspire the way that Mother Teresa did. So she said, do not wait for leaders, do it alone, person to person. Part of what she's saying there is everybody can be a leader. But she's also saying that inspiring can sometimes be as easy as going one-to-one -one with specific individuals to get them on board and energized towards the vision. So what does an inspirer do? The very first thing, the most important thing that an inspirer does is an inspirer gives hope. I really want to emphasize that. And I... To do that, I want to take you back as, as an example to one of the first events that I spoke at when I was in Vidin. I was speaking in Vidin, Bulgaria. I was speaking to some business people in town, and I, I was going through some of this same material, and I was explaining to them these different aspects of leadership. And at one point, a gentleman raises his hand and he says, You don't understand. Nice try, but you don't understand. 
Because the people in this community, if you don't know Vidin, it's very poor, the, the, really the poorest region of Bulgaria. He said, the people in this region are, have no hope. They have no reason, they, they won't do this because they have no reason to believe that anything will change. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that's a, a pretty pessimistic outlook. And then I proceeded to live the rest of the year that I, uh, that I did in Vidin, and I came to see mm-hmm. just how true that gentleman was. I, I began to realize the truth of what he said. And I, I tried to do what little I could to try to help people have some level of hope that if you work together, you really can make a difference. And so that was really a, a powerful memory for me to realize the importance of hope in inspiring people to action. Otherwise, people will just sit and not be involved. And another example I wanted to share with you, I want to say right up front with this example, I know that the way this scenario that I'm going to describe turned out wasn't, well, it's still turning out, actually, but it isn't, it isn't always turning out in some perfect, happy ending, Hollywood kind of way. But I, I still think it's just an incredibly powerful example, and that is the country of Egypt. So a few years ago, at the beginning of the Arab Spring, remember where Egypt was. Egypt is a country, you know, huge population in Egypt. The vast majority of the population very unhappy with Mubarak, their leader, and totally unwilling, unable, they thought, to do anything about it. So life went on. One one difficult day after another, life went on, and they didn't do anything about it. For, For decades, Mubarak was in rule, and people, the vast majority of people, didn't favor him. And then, suddenly, within, I think it was two or three weeks' time, in neighboring Tunisia, what happened? Do you remember? Well, a sequence of events occurred in a short period of time that led to Tunisia overthrowing their ruler and having somebody else brought in as the leader. And so then, what happened in Egypt? Almost spontaneously, almost immediately, Millions of people took to the streets and took to the the squares and began to demonstrate and protest and seek a leadership change. Why didn't they do that the week before? They had no hope, right? And what what finally brought them out to actually get involved to the scale of millions? It was hope. They saw it happen, and they thought, you know what? If it can happen there, it can happen here. And I think that is just an an incredibly poignant example of the power of hope. It's an incredible mobilizer of people. And so as you develop as a leader, you think about your vision and you get people on board with it, really make sure that you invest in giving them hope that that out-of-the-box, changing-the-game vision really can materialize. Okay, next step is role modeling strong principles and values. So that's another one of those statements that just sounds really easy. And most of us, if you're like me, most of us think, yes, yes, I need to be a good role model. And I I think I am a pretty good role model. I know some people who aren't. But for me, sure, I'm a pretty good role model, picking up on the previous speaker. I think I'd like to change some other people. But for me, I think I'm just fine. But let me share an illustration with you that will help you understand how difficult it is to really understand what kind of role model you're really being and, and what kind of characteristics you really have. So there's a piece of research that's done. In, uh, I know this was done in America at least. I don't know if it was done beyond there, but there's a piece of research that was done that uh, involves men, okay? So this one's for you, men. Ladies, you can listen in. But there was a question, a single question in the survey, all right? So follow me here. The question was this. Men, you don't have to answer, but be thinking for this question. Are you above average athletically compared to other people in your age group? Okay? So that's the question that these men were asked. Are you above average athletically compared to others in your peer group? And, uh, you know, if you look at the math, I'm a finance person. I work with the numbers. The math here says, well, should be about half of them would be above average, right? So guess what percentage 
of men in the survey declared that they were above average athletically? 100%. Not quite, not quite. But it was 94%. 94%. Usually it's one of the ladies that guesses 100%. <laughs> 94%. That means, let's say there's 20 men in this room. That means that, that uh, 19 of them think they're above average athletically. And they really think that. They really think that. And nine of them, nine of us probably, <laughs> are, are flat wrong. They've just completely misunderstood. And I, I think those numbers to me really, really illustrate how difficult it can be to understand oneself one of our previous speakers talked about self-awareness. It's a hard thing to do in an accurate way. So as, as you think about being a role model, take this advice. Go out and talk to some people that are around you. Get some, get some uh, separate points of view, some independent validation of the kind of role model that you are. Lastly, a uh, couple of quick points. Personally knows and supports people. You really have to connect and engage with people in order to inspire them, and appeals to internal motivation. There's that, that matter of trying to call from deep inside, not trying to dangle some external reward for them and expect that that's going to have real long-term staying power in energizing and inspiring them. Okay, so our last of the five leadership actions is stay the course. And I'll just share a couple of quotes with you here. Naveen Jain is a former Microsoft senior executive. He went on to be a very successful tech entrepreneur as well. He said, success doesn't necessarily come from breakthrough innovation, but from flawless execution. A great strategy alone won't win a game or a battle. The win comes from basic blocking and tackling. So here's a man that understood that when it comes to leadership, the energizing and inspiring and the, the visionary elements, those are all very aspirational for us, right? We all want to be good at those. We want to be, be known for that. Sometimes the staying the course part of leadership is looked at as pretty mundane. This isn't something that we necessarily aspire to be known for. Here's a man that knew that it was critically important, even though it's not the glory part of the job, it's the critical last hundred meters, if you will, in order to achieve success on the vision. And I love Thomas Edison's quote, vision without execution is hallucination, <laughs> right? So it's a good reminder. All the vision in the world without some arms and legs is, uh, is not going to amount to anything. So I've equated this, this action of a leader with being a, a manager, the characteristics of a manager. I think you all understand those pretty well, so I'll just mention briefly that part of the manager's job is, after the vision is established, part of the manager's job is to be real clear about what the strategies and actions are that get us to the vision, right? So they, they design the very specific steps to make that happen. In addition, if you take away no other words on this point than one, Remember the word accountability. That's a, a key role here of, the, of the, the leader in this capacity. They take personal accountability. They establish individual accountability. Steve's gonna come and talk about teamwork here in a moment. They establish collective accountability when teams have responsibility for something. But that accountability is a critical part of this, making sure we deliver the vision. and. Uh, Beyond that, it's typical management functions of checking progress, measuring, removing barriers, things of that nature. Okay? So here's what I'd like to do before I pass it over to Steve. If you have pen and paper there, I'd like you to think, I'll just put these back up again. I'd like you to think about these five actions of a leader and think to yourself, what are the one or two that I do pretty well? I would call those my strengths. And what are the one or two that I still have some opportunities for improvement in? And if you could just, you don't need to do anything else right now, just make a simple note of those. We'll come back to them later. But make a simple note about what are my strengths that I want to leverage 
and what are my opportunity areas that I want to try to improve? Let's just take one moment. Okay, I think most of you are done. So with that, let me turn it back over to Steve. Well, we've come full circle. <laughs> I started the day with you by talking about some amazing results that were achieved by some amazing teams, and I know that the reason you stayed all day is just to hear the end of the story, right? Everybody go, right! Nobody's answering. <laughs> well, let me share with you the results of that. And uh, the one thing I did tell you this morning is it was amazingly simple. And in fact, you might say this should be intuitively obvi obvious, except it wasn't obvious to us. And the more I look at this, these words that I'm going to share with you, it's not only obvious, it's just, it, it is obvious, but it's also profound because it's simple. So I'm only going to ask you to remember a couple words. And I'm going to tell you what those words mean, though, because there's some depth to the words in what this came out to. So first of all, let me talk about the definition of a team. Have any of you ever been on a team? What kind of teams? Basketball. Everybody's a basketball player, right? <laughs> Sports teams. Working teams. Pardon? Project teams. Are any of you married? You're on a team. If you get married, you'll find out very quickly you're part of a team. And in fact, if you're working with anybody else, you're on a team because a team is a number of persons associated with a joint action. So if there's more than just you, you are a team. And these dynamics actually apply. So, Unfortunately, my contact lenses don't focus from there on this slide. <laughs> I've missed the slides all day. So effective teamwork, a joint action by a group of people, individual interests are subordinated, meaning they submit to one another in order to be effective together. It's not just my way, it's our way. That's what makes a team more effective. And hopefully, the results exceed what can be achieved on your own. Most of the time, that's true. I won't say all the time. There can be exceptional individuals on a team that maybe on their own could do better. But as a team, typically, you have an improved result by working together. So if we think of math, and, I, and I'm an engineer, and I can understand this part, 1 plus 1 equals 2. I think it still does. I'm not sure about new math, but I remember it this way. And Certainly not 1 plus 1 equals 1, but more like 3. What we're trying to say here, and it's not exactly 3, but it is more than 2, that you get more effect, more results by working together. Two brains are better than one. Four brains, well, then you have conflict, right? <laughs> okay, these are the four words. I know you've been waiting all day for this slide, so here it is. First of all, we've talked about leadership already, and it requires leadership to, uh, to get the others in place. So everything that Todd has talked about is valid, and I'm not going to re-talk all that because we'd be here all night. But let me tell you about the other ones. Alignment, capability, and compatibility. Okay, that's all you need to know, so we're done. But let me define what these are. First of all, alignment which is the center of that circle because I believe it to be the most important. You think about it. How can you do anything unless you can agree? Even if you're a strong leader, if you don't agree, if you're not aligned in the same direction on something, you can't accomplish anything. If it's missing, a team won't be effective. I put an example of, I don't know if any of you are rowers. You know, you take a skull and you put 
eight people or so with, with paddles, you can have the strongest rowers in the world. You can have a team that really likes each other, but if one wants to go that way and one wants to go that way, you're not going anywhere. So you're going to lose. It's really important on a rowing team that you stay perfectly straight. And that's a good example of this alignment. Now remember I told you about these teams. On one set of production lines, we had teams that were really good and teams that were not so good. One of the things they told us when we said, what makes your team so good? It says, well, we know what our goals are, and we work for them every day. And I said, well, what are they? And they said, this many lines, this many cases per day, this many minutes, you know, you know uptime, this quality standard, and they could just list it. Does all the team agree with that? Absolutely. We talk it every day in a team meeting. In the team that wasn't so good, I said, well, what's the goals of your team? It says, to get here, to work all day, to go home. They had no clue what their goals were, let alone be aligned to it. They weren't even understanding it. So the teams that were better had a clear focus, and we've talked about focus today, and they were much better at it. So a work group will not produce results without being aligned to their purpose, their goals, their plans. They align to the what? What are we here for? What's our objective? They align to the how. How are we going to get there? We've got an objective. What are the means? What are the strategies? What are the plans? Align to the who. Who's going to do this? Within a team, who's got what responsibility? Are we stepping on each other? Are we helping each other? How do we determine who is in charge and who is helping? And the when, when are we going to get things done? What are our milestones? How do we get to the goal in the time we're supposed to? Alignment has, it's good to get it in writing, by the way, so everybody understands it. We've talked about leadership. I had a slide. Did you take a slide out on? Okay, we're, we missed a slide there. All right, so I'm going to tell you more about alignment. It's not up there. There are levels of agreement. I don't know if you know this. So there's a level of agreement that says, I understand. You know, in fact, I, I want to tell you a little story about living in Japan. There's a cultural norm in Japan that says, if they say, if they say maybe, no, I got to get this right now. If they say yes, I understand. If they say maybe, they mean no. And if they say no, they're not Japanese. Because <laughs> they never say no. But you think when they say yes, you're in alignment. And you're not. That means maybe. And so you have to understand. You first need to understand what the facts are, what the goals are, and so on. But then there's another la layer that's called agreement. I not only understand this, but I agree with it. Then there's other layers that look like commitment. I not only understand and agree, but I'm committed to it. I will put myself into it. And then there's ownership. This is part of me. That's when you really have alignment. Now, I'm on a number of different teams and, and boards, and I'm on a board of, of, of leadership of, of something that we have a decision process that requires us to be unanimous. Imagine trying to get 12 people unanimous on anything. So what does it mean then? Does that mean we're not in alignment if we can't get unanimous? No, you can be. Because what happens in the discussion process to drive to alignment, you may come to a point where not only do you understand, you agree to some extent, but you may disagree to some extent. But once you've discussed it enough, you're willing to support your team members to the point where then you can commit to it and own it and defend it. And that means when we leave that boardroom and go out in the parking lot and somebody says, did you agree with this direction? You don't say, no, they all voted me down. No, you say, I am in alignment and I own this. Even if inside you say, I would have done differently. That's alignment. When you can work together, even if you're not 100% there, but you can agree to move on and defend it and support it as a team. That's when you've got alignment. Okay, we've talked about leadership. 
And it's good to have a leader of a team, and that leadership can be one person or it can rotate. Sometimes we rotate leadership just to give everybody the chance, and that helps build skills. The next thing, speaking of skills, is capability. And when we look at skills, it involves lots of things. It involves talent, uh, knowledge, understanding, wisdom, everything that is you, uh, you want to bring those to the table. So you want to make sure you have the right skills on a team. You make sure you're not missing skills. You want to make sure you develop skills. You put people in the right roles, people that are strong in some things. Uh, others are stronger than others. Diverse skills because we all bring something different. And it's the skills that help to to get you in the direction you want to go. Now, remember I said this morning that the uh, one of the teams had an 11-year average work history together, and the other team had two years. Remember I said the two-year team was better? Well, that made us scratch our head for a while until we penetrated the, the issue of skills. And what we found out is that particular team that was two years had the best way to use their diversity of skills than anybody else in the whole operation. They knew who was the expert at every part of the operation, and they would put them in that part of the operation, and then they would have that person train everybody else over and over and over. They trusted each other enough to believe that, you know, you're better that, at taking pictures than I am. So I'm going to let you take the pictures right now. Is that okay? I'm going to trust you with that. And eventually, you're going to teach me how to do this. But together, we're going to have the best skills eventually. And we'll be solid. That 11-year team had some of that. But they didn't always help each other. They were all strong. But sometimes they did things alone. And they didn't leverage your skills as well. Now, their results were not much worse. They were virtually tied. But that, that young team was slightly ahead. So you need the strong, diverse skills. You need the ongoing skill development. We're always learning. One of the things I appreciated about working for Parker & Gamble is they have built into our budgets every year. We do self-development training. We're always allowed to go out and get more skills. They valued people enough to know that that's going to make them better employees and better team members. And putting them in the right roles, assigning work purposely, not like Todd just said, who wants to do this and who wants to do that? Uh, we, we did a team building exercise once on, on a team I was on. We were supposed to leave the building and go do something together and figure out how as a team we can be effective. So we decided to go bowling. Anybody here bowl? You ever bowl? You have bowling alleys here? Okay. Well, instead of us all just bowling our own game, we decided we're bowling one game, all of us. There was 20 of us. So there's tw how, many, how many times do you roll a ball in one bowling game? 20 times. So we each got one ball, one roll. And so first frame, the first person rolled, second, and then the second half, the next person rolled. And collectively, we scored a game in bowling. It was terrible. <laughs> because we had a wide diversity of skills in bowling. So we came out, we were, we were well under 100. But we came away from that and said, well, what did we learn as a team? If our goal, if we're aligned about improving our score, our score and we want to do the best we can, how do we leverage what we did? So we just started discussing what we observed among us. Some people were better at trying to get a strike from right from the beginning. They could put it, what's in the pocket, it's called the pocket, where it blows the pins up. Other people couldn't do that, but when it came to one pin standing alone, they were really good at that. And so we then designed the next game so that every, every decision on who did it was given to the strength of that person. We did better the next game. By the third game, we were being very strategic in that um, we were... We were training each other on how to do this. Even if you were the best, you might train the next person and let them try it because maybe they were doing something wrong. And by the third game, I think we scored 150, where we started below 100. That's an example of how we came together to leverage skill and to teach each other and coach each other. And the good part of that is none of us had an independent goal. Our, our sole 
goal was to together score the best score, to achieve a goal. Okay, also involved in capabilities methods. And you know, every good football, your football, our football, requires strategy, requires methods, requires a game plan, that it requires rules and, and uh, success measures, accountability, how do you work together? So methods, uh, having a good set of, of common practices is a way to make sure that you're all on the same playing field. It'd be terrible to play a football game if you all had different rules. You also want your game plays when you're operating a line or whether you're just doing a project. What are your strategic choices? Who's accountable for them? What are the success measures for what you're going to do? The last thing is compatibility. Compatibility, somebody earlier told me, it's, you did, Chris, Christy, right? Alex, yeah, like I said, Alex. Sorry. Um, compatibility, I don't know if you use the word chemistry. Do you use that? We do. Uh, in English, we will say chemistry. Compatibility speaks to how well we get along. So go back to our two good teams versus the bad teams. As we talked about what makes you so good, they said, well, we hang out. When we leave work, we go out and drinking, or we go fishing on the weekends. We love each other. If somebody's missing, we're calling them to find out what's wrong with them. The bad teams hardly knew each other's names. They didn't care. They left work, never saw them again. And what we saw was a commitment to each other that made so much difference. So this compatibility speaks to um, getting along well, having a sense of harmony. And what are some of those characteristics? Okay, we've been talking all day about values. And all of these, by the way, have values. When you think about alignment, the value is there's somebody other than myself. I'm living in a team. I value and respect other people to get aligned. I'm willing to subordinate my way for the team's way. That's a value. What about skills? I value your skills. I appreciate you. I'm not in competition with you. I want to be a team member with you, and eventually I want to be you. If we can all be as good as you at taking a picture, we will have a really strong picture-taking team. But here, the compatibility is where values really come out because think about trying to be on a good team that doesn't trust each other, that doesn't believe each other, that isn't sincere with each other. Or how about they don't include some people on the team. They're not courteous. They don't care. They don't invest time with each other. They're not transparent with each other. You think about friendship. You think about they loved each other. These good teams loved each other, and they would say that. And it was so far out, the out of the boundaries from everybody else, it was incredible. So when we looked at some of the other teams and we got these scores back on these tests, sometimes the compatibility score would be low. They could have all the capability and all the alignment, but why is this team doing so poorly and they, they had a low compatibility score? You go ask them and say, well, we don't like our team manager. We all hate him. We don't trust him. Well, how well will you perform as a team if you don't trust your leader? And so when I talked to the operations leader, I said, do you think there's a solution here to getting results for this team? So those three components as were actually our scores, compatibility, uh, capability, and alignment. And that's how this tool worked, that measured for each one. All the questions we asked them drew data from them that says this is how they thought of their team. And amazingly, it came out in a direct correlation with their actual results. Now, my experience is that when I see uh, two people or more working together and something's going wrong, and they're not getting along well together or something's not happening the way it should, it's in these areas. I, I got a friend who recently lost a job, and he, he lost the job because he and his boss weren't seeing eye to eye, and he got fired, and now he's looking for another job. So I shared, I shared this model with him and said, tell me what you think went wrong. 
And after, after he saw this and, and a way to, to dimension this, a way to think about it, he said, wow. Well, first of all, we were in an alignment. That really helps me to see. We weren't on the same page. We tried to be, but we never were. And that affected their compatibility. They couldn't get along because they were always disagreeing. They have both had the skills, plenty of skills, wasn't enough. That baseball team that traded those people from the West Coast to the East Coast, West Coast won, won more, East Coast lost. What do you think happened? Any guess? Pardon? When the, when the two players went to the other team, the rest of the team felt devalued. You're bringing these guys in to fix us. We'll show you. We'll do worse. You know, you, when you have low expectations of somebody, do you get high results? No. Whatever somebody expects of you, sometimes that's the way you perform. And they went down. These two players came in as king of the hill, believing they were all there is, paid more than anybody else in the team. That lowered morale, lowered team unity, compatibility went out the door, and they played terrible. On the other hand, the team that was taken from them, what happened with them? They say, we'll show you. We can be good without those guys because we're a tight team. You think that our team was totally guided by those two guys, but we're going to show you and we're going to do better, and they did. So it's not always one component. If one's strong, the skills were strong both ways, but the chemistry, the alignment, the agreement, the goals, all of those are in there. And I would say that if you're on a team that's not working well together, it's missing one of these or more. And you need them all for an effective team. So, in a, com in a compatibility, you have alignment, you commitment, you have a culture of trust, you know your teammates. How do you know them? Well, you get to know them. You develop relationships. You understand them. And you know, know something about their lives. You have face-to-face, -face, you have meetings, you, you do team building, you, you spend time together. You can't know someone well and trust them well unless you spend time together. Okay, wasn't that a simple answer? Intuitively obvious to the casual observer, right? And yet, we had to extract this from the teams. And for us, it ended up being a profound understanding. And once we knew this, we could analyze every team and say, what's missing? And instead of giving safety training to everybody when there was an injury, we could focus team by team and saying, what will help this team? Compatibility issue, skills issue, alignment issue, two of those or all three of them, and get very focused to help those teams get built better. And that's what they did. They got focused team by team to build them into the strongest teams they could be. And we achieved the goal in six months without touching the equipment. It wasn't physics and it wasn't machinery. It was teams. What an amazing thing. It made my life easy since I'm an engineer. Okay, we got the three. <laughs> okay, so as you look at this, just think to yourself too. If you're on a team right now, ask yourself the question, you know, is there something missing on your team? Is one of these elements, just those words will be enough to trigger your thought. Uh, I don't know if I told you this, but I, maybe I did this morning. I repeat myself then. I gave this presentation to a construction company, and one person on the, this group says, now I know why we have a great team. And the other one says, now I know why we have a lousy team. And they hadn't talked to each other. I said, well, this team over here can now be a coach for this team over here and you can help them to round out their total picture. So, if you're working from, with more than yourself, one, two, or more people, you need to give thought to how, what, what elements, how strong are you? Leadership, which we talked about all day, and then alignment, capability, and compatibility. One final quote. You can read that, because I'm too it. far away. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just make a couple of, uh, couple of final comments. Thank you, Steve. So 
One thing that we'd like to do as we're finishing up is uh, do just take a moment related to the team. I, I don't know if you were reading the slide while Steve was talking, but do take a moment. If there's one or two of these that you feel like the team that you're working on does pretty well, make a note of it. And if there's one or two that you feel like, I think that's what we need to do better, make a note of that as well. <clears throat> okay. So I want to finish with one final quote in a moment. But uh, one other thing I wanted to do is just really encourage you We've asked you a couple times today to, to make some notes about where you think you have improvement opportunities or strengths. So hopefully you're taking some good notes with you. And the next step in the process is to begin to really think about what are some specific actions I can take in order to improve in some of these areas or leverage some of these strengths. You might think of that as a personal development plan and I know Christy mentioned a moment ago, his group has some great expertise in coaching people on that path. So if you'd like someone to come along with you to help you on that journey of thinking about what are the actions I should take and maybe get some guidance and counsel along the way as you try to improve in these areas, my experience over many years is that trying to do this on your own is hard. <laughs> it's extremely hard. And having someone who can come alongside you, especially someone like Christy and his group who have experience with this, that can be a huge help. So please do reach out to them and avail yourself of their offer to help you in this area. So now the final quote uh, from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. And I, I want to compliment you one last time on your enthusiasm and your engagement throughout our session today. It's been, uh, it's been a little warm in the room, especially when the bright lights are shining on you. And uh, I know many of you have been here throughout the day. And uh, so thanks for making that investment. Again, it tells me a lot about you. And honestly, if you remember, one of my slides along the way had this comment that in order to be inspired, you really have to give someone hope, right? Well, no kidding, with all, with all honesty, uh, the level of energy and the passion that you guys have shown throughout this day towards really growing as leaders, really investing in yourself to grow and to change you, not just everybody else out there. That gives me great hope for the future for you guys and, and for your country. As Christy said, you, you really can, working together, you really can make a difference. And I have a great hope after today that that will happen. So I compliment you for that. And uh, lastly, I just wanted to say, I think on behalf of Steve and myself from the, the United States contingent for today's session, it's been a lot of fun for us. We've enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the opportunity to engage you, uh, to share some of our experience with you. I've really enjoyed the chance to meet some of you during the breaks and look forward to chatting with some of you as soon as we wrap up here. So thank you all. Thank you very much, thank you very much, Todd Geist and Steve Simpson, thank you very much for the final moment for this conference. And of course, thank you very much for you for uh, being with us to this uh, conference for the entire day. Only two minutes, I would like to ask you for more and please allow me to switch back to Romanian. I guess that uh, o să fiu un pic mai ușor. Uh, și înainte să vă urăm de bine la seară bună și să vă mulțumim pentru participare, după cum vedeți, vorbesc un pic mai repede, totuși v-aș provoca patru lucruri pe care le luați din ziua de astăzi. Patru cuvinte cheie. Cine vrea, cine mai are energie pentru această oră. Cu ce plecați din ziua de astăzi? Hai să vedem. Patru cuvinte cheie. Nu cinci, doar patru. Te rog. Unitatea echipei, mulțumesc frumos. Inspirație și motivație să fie acolo. O cunoaștere mai bună a proprii persoane și am promis doar patru, deci o să mai iau o singură mână ridicată, te rog. Și self-leadership și vă mulțumesc pentru faptul că ați ridicat mai mulți dintre voi mâna. Acum, avem următoarele două...
provocări pentru voi și se va continua provocarea de altfel în spațiul online. Există două concursuri. Unul dintre ele presupune completarea unui mic, mic formular pe care probabil l-ați, l-ați întâlnit deja de-a lungul zilei. Puteți să lăsați la ieșire la echipa de voluntari. Dintre aceste, volu- dintre aceste formulare, pardon, echipa de organizatori va selecta unul dintre ele și acea persoană, pentru că o să vă invităm să vă scrieți numele, va fi invitată, unde credeți? La următoarea ediție a conferinței va fi invitată să fie pe scenă unul dintre speakerii sau vorbitorii pentru uh, ediția conferinței din 2016, pare îndepărtat, dar uh, asta e invitație ca să completați acele formulare. A doua provocare vine din zona de concursuri. Vor exista întrebări pe pagina de Facebook, partenerii care acordă premii, vorba de editura publică și EMAG așteaptă să acorde aceste premii și le mulțumim indirect pentru acest lucru. Așa că păstrați un ochi pe pagina de Facebook a uh, conferinței să vedeți ce se întâmplă acolo. Uh, și în final, de-a binelea, dați-mi voie să vă mai citesc încă o dată care sunt partenerii și organizatorii acestui eveniment. Uh, Fanvertising și liderii de mâine București sunt uh, organizatorii. Apropo, mulțumesc și eu pentru invitație la această uh, conferință. Uh, mulțumiri speciale Ambasada Statelor Unite, ISEC, Alpha Bank, Raiffeisen Bank, Nestle, EMAG, Editura Publica, Self Trust Academy, Teatrul Odeon pentru spațiul oferit, Brigada de Voluntari, Vlad Eftenie, pentru pozele făcute împreună cu echipa lui. Nu în ultimul rând o să nominalizez Alex Zamfir, Raluca Deaconu, Andrei și Bogdan de la Tehnic, Anca Dobrescu și vă rog frumos, o ultimă rundă de aplauze pentru voi, în primul rând că stăți la această oră. Mi-a făcut plăcere să petrecem o zi împreună. Uh, un singur mesaj îl am, dacă vreți, un pic mai personal de la mine către voi. Uh, mă bucur foarte mult că există astfel de oameni și mă bucur că Totuși, România poate să aibă și o jumătate plină a paharului. Eu sunt Florin Ghinda, am fost gazda voastră pentru o zi destul de lungă. Vă mulțumesc pentru rezistență. Seara faină să aveți!